now you will undoubtedly find it helpful to have your Bible open at the sixth chapter of the book of Acts. And as we have our Bibles open, let's bow for a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge afresh that as we open the pages of this book, you alone are its author, and this is the very word of the living God. You speak to us still from it, and we pray that this day you will do so in your great mercy. Come to us, Lord, and deliver us from the mere words of human wisdom which perish, but grant us the living word of the living God which will not return to you void. Grant us, too, hearts and minds that are utterly open to all that you would say, and afterwards help us to be like the Bereans who searched the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Our confidence is in your word, and our hope is in your grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now, for those of you, many of you, who have not been here over the last number of weeks, this is the fourth of a series of four sermons on the priorities of the apostolic church as we discover them in these early chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. Over the past three Sundays, we have discovered in Acts 2 and 3 and 4, and then in Acts 5, that there are well-described and unmistakable priorities that have been set before us in Holy Scripture as the apostolic urgency in building the church of Jesus Christ in the first century. And we discovered in these Sundays that this was a deliberate establishing of priorities in the church's life. The need for it, we have said several times, derives, of course, from the very basic fact of our humanness. Because we are human and not divine, We have limited resources in almost every sphere of our lives. We have limited time and energy and money, and so we have to make decisions about where our priorities are going to lie. And every day, by the choices we make, we declare where our priorities are. We will often say, for example, I have no time for this, that, or the other. But we demonstrate by the way we choose to use our time the things that are priorities to us. And that kind of assessment of priorities is an absolute essential for properly ordered life for anybody. And if it is essential for us personally, how infinitely more essential it is in the church of Jesus Christ, that we should not simply drift from day to day, responding to pressures that are upon us from one sphere or another, but that we should have well-established priorities. And in the church of Jesus Christ, the thing that obviously matters is that our priorities will be God's priorities, so that our Christian growth will be marked by this, that the things that are important to me will increasingly become the things that are important 
to God. Now, as we have searched our way through these early chapters of Acts, what we have discovered is that there is a ringing priority in the very chapter in which the day of Pentecost is described of the preaching ministry in the apostles' life and work. The priority of preaching stands out not only there, but through the whole of the book of Acts. We discover also that there is in chapters 3 and 4 a priority given to prayer. And again and again throughout the book of Acts, this is something you discover is a decisive element in apostolic life and ministry. They give themselves, devote themselves to prayer. Then last Sunday we discovered in chapter 5 in that extraordinary account of Ananias and Sapphira and the strange judgment of God that came upon them that there is another priority in the church of Jesus Christ and it is the priority of holiness in the lives of its members. And so we discover God reacting in an extraordinary way many of us would feel when Ananias and Sapphira lie to the Holy Spirit and God, as it were, breaks out in judgment upon them. What the church is recognizing is that there is a priority in the purpose of God of holiness in the church. This morning we come to the sixth chapter of Acts and to this quite epoch-making occasion in the church's life and growth. It's really, I suppose, the first major reformation which took place in the life of the apostolic church. We speak of the Reformation, the Reformation, as being what took place in the 16th century, beginning in Germany. But of course, this is a Reformation in every true sense of the word when the whole structure of the Church of Jesus Christ, the assessment of its priorities, was being established and set down for the sake of its future. And here in this Reformation, we discover that there are lessons for us to learn about the priorities that we need to reaffirm in our day. It happened in this way. There had been, as you will recollect, remarkable growth in the early church, both by addition, in chapter 2, verse 41, there were added to their number about 3,000 people that day, then by multiplication, for example, at the beginning of chapter 6, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the NIV translates it, but the real word is multiplying. So there was addition and there was multiplication, and now the devil is obviously roused. And the gates of hell, as Jesus predicted, were set against the church, first by physical opposition, what we would probably call persecution. And the apostles discovered themselves not being listened to warmly and acceptably, but being brought into a place of judgment and finally into a place of incarceration where they were warned, you must speak in this name no more. And at that point, the church went to prayer and the people of God cried to God for His grace in this situation. Then there came not only opposition from the official world outside the church, but opposition from the satanic world which had come inside the church. 
And that opposition was through corruption and hypocrisy in Ananias and Sapphira. And that was met by discipline and cleansing and judgment. But then at the beginning of chapter 6, had you thought that we might be saying, well now, there are the crises that the church is meeting and they are over and they will now be free to move on into a period of peace and progress, you would be wrong. Because immediately the devil is forming another strategy and his next strategy is again inside the church, not persecution, not corruption, but division and disunity. And you will notice how it happens. The problem is described for us in chapter 6, verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against those of the Hebraic Jews, speaking against them because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, of course, it has been obvious if you have been reading through the book of Acts that a loving concern for the needy was one of the marks of the early church, one of the delightful evidences of the grace of God. And so they started giving of their substance to others who were more needy than themselves. There was a group of people who were particularly needy, the widows of the ancient world who had no state support of any kind, so they began to minister to them. And that was a good work which they were engaged in, but the devil immediately comes and divides them according to a certain kind of racial division. Those Jews who were of Grecian culture against those Jews who were of Hebraic culture, and they began to murmur against one another. Immediately they saw that there was perhaps a little bit more attention being paid, or so they construed, to other people than themselves. They began to murmur and complain. And the word, as I was saying to the children, is a word that almost conveys its meaning to you by its sound. They began to grumble and spread discontent and grievances around the church. And somebody had to deal with that. And the apostles immediately recognized that there is a major danger. What was the major danger? The major danger was that social issues were going to become dominant and the major question of praying and preaching were going to be secondary in the church. And so they said, we need a reformation. We need a reorganization of the church's life that this may not happen. Now, why did they lay so much emphasis on this? Why did they regard it as so dangerous? Because clearly they did. And we need to ask, why was that? What was this problem which attracted such concentrated and radical concern? Well, there were three things which I want to mention to you that drew the concern of the apostles. And the third of them is the most important from our point of view this morning. The first is, of course, 
that what was happening, however it had happened, from whatever source it had come, what had happened was an absolute and solemn denial of the very nature of the church of Jesus Christ. You grasped that, did you, while Chuck was reading the passage to us? That this is a denial of the very essence of what the church of Jesus Christ is. What is it? It is a society in which all of these divisive matters are done away. We are all one in Christ Jesus. There are no more Greeks and Jews. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And they were separating. Who are you? We are the Greeks, they would say, concerned about our widows. And then the murmur, 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 murmur would begin. And the others on the other side, who are you? We are the Hebrews. And they are being very resentful to us, and so on. But you see what it is. And it is true, my dear friends, whenever the seeds of disunity are sown in the church of Jesus Christ, it is a denial of the very nature of the body of Jesus Christ. The devil is not in the least bit concerned about addition. He is not at all troubled by multiplication so long as he can add into it division. And this is, as so often, his strategy. Many of you will know that I have been for the last four years most mercifully now brought to an end the convener of Glasgow Presbytery's superintendence committee which meant that I have to travel around other churches and deal with matters in churches which are causing concern. So often division between people. Now what I want to say to you is that the ones that really worried me were the ones in evangelical churches where people began to major on minors and to bring into the place of centrality things that were really peripheral. And the church of Jesus Christ became divided. And the extraordinary spectacle of people who would not grown up men. And I'm bound to confess to you, I find it more amongst men than amongst women. Grown up men who were not speaking to each other. It is a denial of what Christ is building which is a society where there is neither bond nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. But here's the second thing. It was a disregarding of a solemn biblical warning. The word complained in verse 1 in the NIV is really the Greek word for murmuring. Speaking under the breath is one of the things it means, you know, the kind of sotto voce type of speaking to each other. You know the kind of thing people do when they don't want somebody else to hear, have you heard, by the way, you know, about so and so, and we speak to each other not for public consumption, the ultimate blasphemy is when it becomes just for prayer, you know, just for prayer. And this kind of thing is going on all the time. It is a process by which people who have a grievance gather together other people to support their cause. And so 
the murmuring continues. That, of course, was one of Israel's cardinal sins in the wilderness. Do you remember? When they were in the wilderness, they murmured in the wilderness against Moses and against Aaron, but Moses said to them, it's against God you are murmuring. And Paul takes a considerable part of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 to highlight this for us and say to us, you receive the warning of these people in the Old Testament record who murmured and were visited by the angel of death. Because if it seems a mild aberration to us, it is not a mild aberration to God. So there was a denial of the very nature of the church in this, a disregarding of a biblical warning. But there was also a distraction, and this is the thing I want to spend the rest of our time on. There was a distraction from a God given priority. The apostles recognized immediately that the church of Jesus Christ was liable to become absorbed with and indeed hijacked by this particular social concern rather than by spiritual concern. And so they said, we need to reform our structures in order to safeguard the priorities of prayer and preaching. Now, you will notice they did not say, these social concerns are no business of ours, and we will do nothing but preach and pray. But what they did say is there is a grave danger of the spiritual priority, which is the calling of the church of Jesus Christ, being lost because we are being increasingly concerned and our time absorbed with these issues. And what was a threat then has become a fact in our own generation. You might have expected it in the wider mixed body of the church, for example, in our own General Assembly, that the priority of the spiritual would be swamped by the social and practical, which, as I say, the New Testament church did not ignore, but refused to regard as its priority. But let me read to you from the material sent out to commissioners to this year's General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. There were identified issues expected to excite the assembly. One, an ecumenical hearing on former Yugoslavia. Two, Christian approaches to defense and disarmament. Three, Britain and the arms trade. Four, church action on poverty. Now, of course, there is no question. These are all of them important issues. A Christian who is concerned to be relevant to the times will be concerned about these issues. But my dear friends, I need to ask you, are these the things that ought to excite the church of Jesus Christ above all in our time? Or should we not share... John Stott's concern 
as he writes about a church assembly he attended and tells us what he said there. The assembly has given its earnest attention to the hunger, poverty, and injustices of the contemporary world. Rightly so. I have myself been deeply moved by them. But I do not find a comparable concern or compassion for the spiritual hunger of men. The church's first priority remains the millions and millions who, as Christ and his apostles tell us again and again, are without Christ and perishing. This assembly professes to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ sent his church to preach the good news and make disciples. I do not see this assembly eager to obey his command. The Lord Jesus Christ wept over the impenitent city which had rejected him. I do not see this assembly weeping as he did. Now, as I say, you might expect that in the broader spectrum of the world church. What I find alarming is that it is increasingly a characteristic of the evangelical church also. Let me give you one or two indicators. A missionary leader recently called my attention to what he thought was a highly significant fact, and so do I, that in the evangelical world, the organizations which are awash with money are those which minister to the physical and social needs of people in areas of the world where there is need of agriculture. For example, they go there and are concerned to meet with them. Now, again, let me not be misunderstood. I think that is an excellent work to be doing. But he went on to say, at the same time, the societies which are simply concerned with preaching the gospel and planting churches are starved of money. And these evangelical organizations which are concerned with the social and practical and material needs of people to which I contribute and you will too, are almost all financed from evangelical sources. Then can you tell me why it is that I find speaking personally that my heart is torn and deeply moved when I am faced with pictures of starving, hungry, homeless men and women and children, and my heart aches and breaks for them. But I do not find my heart aches and breaks in the same way for the respectable people I meet going up and down Buchanan Street, who, if I am consistent with what I believe, are under the judgment of a holy God and going to a lost eternity without Christ and without hope. Now, does poverty and hunger and homelessness in this world matter more to me than eternal loss without Christ in the next. That's why it troubles me when I read the life of Robert Murray McShane, which I was commending to Chuck that he should read as one of his first priorities when he comes to Scotland. And I discover McShane 
prostrated over his bed, weeping his heart and soul out. For those who are lost without Christ in Dundee, and is inconsolable when people try to raise him up. Why is it that modern Christians know so little of that, and I talk to myself as though there were no one else here? That's what struck me when I read an article that came to me from the United States some time ago asking the question, who weeps for the Christless? Well, the expected answer would be the evangelical church. But does it? That may be why a personal report from a layman with wide medical experience who was associated with the selection school for ministers when I was a member of it wrote in his report being asked to inquire into the disillusionment of many young evangelical pastors. Now he was only focusing on one thing and you will realize there were others but it was this. He said, I think one of the great things is the difficulty in finding a role, an R-O-L-E, a role. The role of the pastor, he says, used to be, he is a medical doctor, the role of the pastor used to be the cure of souls. What a beautiful phrase. That's why he was called. And that's what he gave his energies to. But that is no longer acceptable in the modern world, and so he looks for another role. Instead, he takes courses to become a sharp administrator, a good thing to become. An amateur psychologist, a dangerous thing to become. A part-time social worker, a personal counselor, and sometimes just a political agitator. But beloved, the pastor's responsibility is still the cure of souls. And anything that diverts him from that into anything else is a threat to the building of the church of Jesus Christ in the world. Let me press this upon you from the teaching of Jesus, whom no one could imagine was heartless about the poor and the needy and spoke more than most people on the theme. But he identifies priorities, for example, in the simple domestic case of Martha and Mary. And Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, drinking in his words and worshipping him. And Martha says to Jesus, are you not going to do anything about this woman? Will you not tell her to get up and act? And he said, Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen the better part. And when Judas and the others said, when the woman poured out her alabaster box of ointment in extravagant love to him, Judas said, why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? Jesus said, the poor you always have with you. Now nobody was a greater champion of the poor than Jesus. But he said, the poor you always have with you. But the priority is what this woman has done because what she has done is going to be spoken wherever the gospel is preached. This is what the gospel does.
Now, what did they do then? As we draw to a conclusion, let me point it out to you. They did not neglect the social implications of the gospel, but they put first things first. And the really significant thing is this. Now, please try to hold on to this truth. They treated the social implications of the gospel as a spiritual task. David Wells, in these remarkable books, which I must take time to commend to you, No Place for Truth, or whatever has happened to evangelical theology, and God in the Wasteland, two books published by IVP, you really, if you want to hear a modern prophet, you need to read these books. David Wells says, there is apparently no distinction between the good works done by the godless in the world and the good works done by the Christian church. But the distinction lies in this. For the Christian church, this is a spiritual task which requires godly people. Now that's what they did. They chose seven men. They did not say, Now then, brethren, we are going to wash our hands of this whole business of our concern for the widows. You choose anybody you like. And get the task done, but leave us to minister the word of God and pray. They rather said, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And we will pray over them as they did and commit them to this ministry. Now, you will notice that we're only told much about one of them. He's Stephen. Notice what's true about Stephen. Here is is the social worker of the church, the leader of them. He is full of the Holy Spirit. He is full of faith. He is full of spiritual wisdom. Not worldly wisdom, did you notice? But spiritual wisdom. He is full of Scripture. My goodness, that's why the man stands up in chapter 7 and goes from beginning to end of the Scripture and tells them everything Scripture teaches. He was saturated in it. He was full of prayer. That's why we discover that in verse 59 of chapter 7, when they were stoning him, Stephen was praying. And he was full, oh, don't miss this, he was full of the beauty of holiness. When he was before the Sanhedrin, they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now, that was not part of his natural features. That was the glory of God shining out of the man's life. Now, I tell you what's the distinctive feature, therefore, of the social involvement of the church of Jesus Christ. It's this. It's that kind of person who does it. And the hands that are stretched out to the needy are the hands of Jesus. The wisdom by which the task is done is the wisdom that comes from above. The heart that beats with the need of these people is not the same as the heart of the godless. It is the very heart of Jesus Christ beating for the sake of those who are lost. The priorities that they have set are all the very same priorities that the church of Jesus Christ has been set. This is the characteristic of that ministry. And they said, we, we will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Not everybody 
was engaged in preaching. But everybody was engaged in praying. And that was their great ministry. Now I want to say this to you. It's only when you have established and consecrated yourself to that apostolic priority that you're going to be any use in a desperately needy world outside today. What we need in the social activity of the church of Jesus Christ, and we are greatly privileged to have some share in it through our brother and sister who work with the Glasgow City Mission. What we need are people who overflow with the glory. Else, we might as well leave it to other people because the distinctive thing about the Christian church's social ministry is the kind of people who are engaged in it. We will devote ourselves, this will be our priority, to prayer and the ministry of the Word. When the Church of Jesus Christ loses that priority, my dear friends, it ceases to be what it was called to be by God. And we are in deep trouble. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we bow before you. For your great name's sake, sort out our priorities. In our personal lives, in our family life, in our church life, in our service for you, wherever it may be, and grant that we may glorify you for the praise of your great name. Amen.